this lecture, we're going to discuss statistical tests and different types of error. Our definitions for today, parametric, non-parametric, error bar, standard deviation, range covered previously, t-test, ANOVA, regression, more later, paired and unpaired. I want you to be able to identify the proper statistical test to use given a certain scenario. So if I were to say, compare these two things, I want you to know comparison, two things, what type of data, is it parametric or non-parametric, okay, this type of test. And to relate normal distributions and error to which test is going to be appropriate. Something we're not doing here is the actual on-the-ground math for each one of these tests. So for a simple good statistical question that can uh, kind of spur us to what we want to answer, let's head out to the garden. Hey, Ecology Crew, so back in the garden today, and we're looking at what should be planted when I extend the garden next year. So we can see this large expanse of yard here, and it tends to grow relatively poorly later in the summer. So I want to extend my garden, and I want to plant some new plants in it. The question is, what type of root vegetables and what type of greens should I put in that extended portion of the garden? And I want to know what is growing best. So we could do this using some stati simple statistics. We have here our carrots, which we've discussed previously. They're still growing very well. A good root vegetable that I will can and use for the winter. We also have over here some potatoes. So they're looking a little sad because they've already finished most of their growth uh, underground and they're just starting to wilt. As the tops wilt, they're going to be putting all their resources underground, which will later be put into my stomach. So those are our two main root vegetables. And I'd really like to know which one's going to be able to produce the most underground root tissue per unit space in the garden. And that is a comparison for which I will need a statistical test comparing two separate groups. I'm also growing do some leafy vegetables. So here we have ah, some lettuce and some Swiss chard. There's a potential for growing kale in this garden and I've done that before. So next year, should I plant more lettuce or should I plant more Swiss chard or should I plant more kale? Well, that's gonna be three groups and that's gonna require a different type of statistical test uh, to be used. So we're going to cover in this lecture the different types of statistical tests that can be used to compare two groups and to compare three groups. But first, let's do a little ecology just for fun. So I'll also show you my garden. I've got poppies. I have all the poppy seeds I need from that and some of them tend to replant. I may also want to tell you that um, got over here some carrots. I cut the carrot tops off during the winter and started regrowing those. Since they're biannual, those carrots are actually going to grow carrot seed. It looks just like Queen Anne's lace because that's the same species. You may have also seen, we just went from very, very sunny to very, very dark. There is uh, a whole ecosystem change and a whole gradient along this garden. And if I were to grow carrots along the entire garden, we could actually measure the amount of sunlight and the amount of carrot growth which would require a third type of statistical test. So yeah, there's some poppies growing here. Those of you who take in medical botany may recommend, recognize this is Papa somniferum, but no, we don't use it for that. And these are actually, these are lettuce flowers. So lettuce grows naturally in my garden if I let it flower and go to seed. And since this, this video is taken after July 21st, all the lettuce goes to flower at about July 21st. That's when it's going to start bolting. So that's a little physiology for you there too. And of course we got, that's my uh, Samuel's zucchini plant. So just some other fun little garden things. While we're out here, we can see that the gardens actually used to use a lot of different plants. And honestly, if you're taking an ecological approach and we do not know what type of summer it's going to be, whether it's going to be blasting sun, or if it's going to be just kind of cold and dreary, it's best to actually put a whole bunch of crops in. But let's pretend for the sake of this lecture that I want to choose between carrots and potatoes and between kale, lettuce, and Swiss chard. We're back. So what I'm looking for out there is what plants are going to be making the most food for me. Am I going to be doing potatoes or carrots? 
I could also be asking if plants are going to grow better depending on the amount of fertilizer, but as I actually saw out there was the amount of sunlight that is going to vary along that ecological gradient. So I've got a couple different questions here. Maybe should I put, plant more chard, kale, lettuce? There are different types of questions and those are going to require different types of answers. So before I can actually get to the statistics of this, I have to take a look at what the population is and what type of data I'm going to be getting. So let's look at the data and we'll see two types of data here. And focusing on one type of distribution First type here is parametric. If you think parametric, think parameters. There are certain things we know about that population that we have to say are correct. And the most common one of those is that it is a normal distribution. And that normal distribution is something we know about the population. Even though our sample may not strictly be perfectly normal, we are sampling from a population that is assumed to have a normal distribution. Here, the t-test and the ANOVA are parametric tests that require normalcy in their data. The next thing to compare with parametric is, of course, non-parametric. it does not make the same assumptions as a parametric test. So it's not going to assume a normal distribution. Something like a chi-square test is not a parametric test. A linear regression is a non-parametric test. The distribution of data points we're looking at isn't something that is going to change how the test actually functions. So that's the difference between parametric and non-parametric. Generally speaking, we like to make experiments that are in a parametric um, test. The ANOVA, the t-test are some of the most common ones we will be using in ecology. And that requires a normal distribution. That's a normal, not warmal. There we go, my bad. Normal distribution, 95% of the population falls within two deviations of the mean. The mean is also the mode. There's a unimodal distribution. So there's only one mode, one humped camel here, one median, one mean. These are all relatively close to or exactly the same. And one deviation above that mean and one deviation below that mean, we're going to get 68% of the population. If we use two deviations above and below the mean, that's 95% of that population. Three deviations above and below the mean, 99.8% of the deviations. So we're going to catch most of that population depending on the deviation. We have the example here of uh, pizza delivery times, assuming a normal distribution. We'll be there in this many minutes. Well, plus or minus a, a variation, a variance, is going to be telling us how often to expect the pizza. If the pizza arrives after 50 minutes, that's really rare. If the pizza after arrives after two minutes, they didn't cook it. So these are things we can know based on a normal distribution. And a normal distribution is going to be required for most parametric tests. Compare that with something like a bimodal distribution. So a bimodal distribution is going to have two most common values. So that's going to be two modes. There is a high mode and a low mode, and those are common values that we'll find. Generally speaking, we find grades actually go into a bimodal distribution for first year students. And I shouldn't say first year students, I should say um, Bio 141 students, because not all Bio 141 students are first year students. And one of the big things that drives the grades are just how to study. So students who are taking Bio 141 as an elective their senior year tend to do better and actually cluster in one, in one cluster. And students who are taking Bio 141 as their first ever class 
tend to actually cluster a little lower. So we do actually get a bimodal distribution pretty reliably in introductory biology. We have a large enough sample size to really say that this is a common bimodal distribution. And because it's a bimodal distribution, we can't do parametric tests. So using a t-test to compare, say, the students in Dr. Olney's class versus the students in my class doesn't work because it's not a normal distribution. So the tails and the skew also matter. I believe I mentioned a little bit before, at least at least once or twice, possibly in, well, somewhere, that the tail is how much that error, so how many different types, times you're gonna have like one standard deviation, two standard deviation, three standard deviation, how many deviations we get before we actually capture all the data. So how long that tail is. And the skew is depending if it's swerved to the right or swerved to the left. And those are also going to avoid par assumptions of parametric tests. So a skew distribution, distributions with exceedingly long tails, generally those are the same, or bimodal distributions, these are all not applicable for parametric tests. What about error? We see error bars on most things. We see plus or minus a certain amount pretty often. So what does that really mean? Mean. It means the mean. It means a sample is going to be a certain distance away from the mean. Something we might be seeing is um, Texas is a swing state, someone may say quite boldly, and say that Joe Biden currently is getting 43% of Texans' votes, whereas Donald Trump is getting 45% of Texans' votes. There we go, 45% for number 45. Perfect. The other votes being for, oh, I don't know, Kanye West. So those two values, 45 and 43, one would simply say, well, 45 is bigger than 43. So this isn't a swing state, but if it was 45 plus or minus four points. Well then, that means their sample showed 45%, but they acknowledge that that's plus or minus four points. So it could be a bit off. In another sample from the population, they actually have uh, 49% or 41%. But most samples from the population are going to fall in a certain range away from the mean. So that's what these error bars mean, is 68% of the population is going to be this far away from the mean. And the sample from that population is going to generally be within this range. So 45% for Trump, 43% for Biden, that's going to mean that they are, Texas would be a swing state between Trump and Biden because the error bars are overlapping each other's means. If the error bars are overlapping each other's means, I mean, 68% of the population could really be going in either direction, but not Kanye. And in case you're wondering why I'm including these political things, it's so I can't reuse this lecture in 2022 when I'm going to teach this next, allegedly. <laughs> so if you double the size of the error bar and actually had two error bars, we would be getting 95% uh, of the population. And we may have heard of 95% confidence intervals. Well, I know I have. That means that we have a mean and these big old error bars that say 95% of the population will fall within this range. And that's how we look at error bars when we look at a graph is this standard deviation means that this is the mean and assuming a normal population plus or minus one deviation is 68% of the population. So how do we calculate standard deviation? we use Microsoft Excel or something else. So standard deviation. The actual calculation here is S, standard deviation, is equal to the square root of the sum of each data point minus the sample mean squared over n minus one. So we take each data point and we compare that to the sample mean. So what is the mean for all of the data points we got? 
We take all of those differences, we square each difference, and then we add all of those differences together and divide it by the number of observations minus one. And then we take the square root of that overall, and that is going to give us our standard deviation. Now you see there are two equations there. There's also the population where sigma equals, little lowercase sigma equals the square root of the sum of x minus mu squared. And that is assuming a true known mu, that the actual population, the whole population is known, and the mean of the whole population is known. But if we don't know the mean of the whole population, just the mean of our sample, x bar is what we would call it, and that's the mean of our sample. And the larger the number of samples we've taken, the smaller this value becomes. We can also enter it as equals STDEV, and then we just click on something and select a large range, say cell A2 through cell A28. We just select that range, and Microsoft Excel will calculate standard deviation for us. There's also a way to calculate it in R. What about some other errors? Well, Sometimes these become important, like the range. What is the total variation in population? So if I were to say, what is the average male height in this business? That's going to give me an average. And I say, well, how much deviation is there? Well, most males are five foot nine plus or minus two inches. Ugh, imperial measurements. But what is the range? Well, you see, uh, Johnny here is four foot seven and Ricardo is six foot ten. That's the range, the total variation in a population, which may be important if we want to say, what is the shortest we can make a door for this building and still have everyone pass under it without ducking? And it'd be six foot ten and one half an inch would therefore allow Ricardo to walk through the door without wanging his head on it. So that is some question we'd have for a range. And sometimes people want to know what is the total range um, for Guinness Book of World Records, for example. The standard error that was discussed previously, it's a standard deviation just divided by the square root of n, the number of samples. And modality in an error is the, uh, sorry, modality is kind of an error in the population. So if there's two modes, remember, that's something that is going on in the population that disqualifies some of our earlier assumptions like normalcy. And if we were to do a type of graph with error bars, those error bars are going to be really big because there isn't one mean. That mean is actually between two different modes. So modality is a different type of error that we would deal with in a different type of manner. This is one reason it's important to build a histogram to see what the actual population looks like before building just a single bar to represent the entire population. All right, choosing a statistical test. This is important. Save this for your senior year. I taught this to my seniors once, and they did not learn it. And that was awkward. So types. I'm going to go through it broadly. I want you to draw this on your own. I want you to draw this on your own, not copy it off of the whiteboard and not just copy it off of the slide, but really to draw it out. The first question we have, are we, are we using categorical or are we using uh, qualitative data? So quantitative, sorry. So what does that mean? Well, does each data point have an X and a Y value? So am I saying that this data point is um, this amount of sunlight produces this size of carrot. Well, if I did, that's a quantitative value, and that's going to lead me down one path. Is it a categorical? Well, or is it a numerical? So, or quant qualitative, quantitative. Is it a categorical? So this receives two fertilizer treatments or three fertilizer treatments, or is it a quantitative? this many micro Einsteins of sunlight. So we're going to pass down that and we're going to get different types of regressions. So is there a single treatment? Is there multiple treatments? Well, sunlight is one treatment, so that would just be a simple linear regression. 
Whereas if we had sunlight and fertilizer treatments, we would have a multiple regression. So different types of regression tests are a subject for another day. But we start with saying, is it quantitative data? If so, then we are dealing with a regression test. Every value has an X and a Y, we're dealing with a regression test. This lecture is going to focus on things that are parametric and that do not have that kind of quantifying da quantif yeah, quantifiable data. So we would ask if it's categorical or quantitative in regards to uh, a, single, a single treatment. So what type of treatments are we doing? And if it's just a categorical um, value, we'll actually do a chi-square test, which is going to compare percentages, proportions of two different things. So did uh, people who are eating my, from my garden prefer carrots or prefer potatoes? Now, that's just a categorical kind of thing. We'd say the number that preferred carrots is greater than the number that preferred potatoes. We expect a 50-50. We get a 75-25, and out of our 400 people who ate from my garden, and yeah, I fed a lot, we get more people preferring carrots. So that would be a chi-squared test, and that is covered in back in Bio 142. But we can also think how many treatments are there. And I'm making sure I'm reading all this right. So um, does a comparison, yeah, comparison of means there. So how many treatments are there? If there are just two treatments, it is a t-test. So the t-test there is going to compare two means, assuming it's from a normal population, and assuming they have close or precisely the same kind of deviation. But let's say it was three different treatments. So it isn't just that I'm comparing um, I'm not comparing who prefers carrots and potatoes, that's chi-square. I'm not preferring just carrots and potatoes in terms of how much they can produce per unit garden, that's a t-test. I'm comparing three or more things. So back to that question of lettuce, chard, or kale, if I'm comparing three things for what they can produce, I'm actually going to use an ANOVA, which is not actually comparing means, it's comparing variability which we will get to shortly. So those are the different types of tests I can use. It's also a MANOVA, which again, a little beyond where we're going in this course. Let's look at the t-test first. Most often it's called the student's t-test, created by someone who called himself student. It worked in the Guinness beer factory to see if one batch of beer were different from another batch of beer by taking several samples from what he assumed was a normally distributed population. So it needs to be a normal distributed population. There are other types of t-tests such as Welch's, not named after great jam or anything, but Welch's t-test is assuming that there is not equal variance. Generally speaking, I actually use a Welch's t-test. It's a little more robust than the student's t-test in terms of populations that do not have equal variability. So the potatoes, you may have seen some of those potatoes were wilting a little harder than others. That's because there are multiple types of potatoes there. So the variance is not going to be the same within the potato population compared to within the carrot population. The carrot population, most of those are planted at the same time. And the ones that weren't, well, they're going to create variance given, but they're not like a different cultivar. So the variance is probably higher in potatoes than in carrots, so I would use a Welch's t-test to compare those if they have different variance levels. We're also dealing with unpaired data. There's something called a paired t-test, which compares before and after. So I did a fertilizer treatment this year. Last year, I planted potatoes, and I had much less... I didn't add fertilizer. This year, I planted potatoes, I added fertilizer, they grew up so fast, and then they collapsed on themselves. So... Yay! It's a before and after treatment, though. It's the same species, it's potatoes, and there is the before and there is the after. So that is a paired t-test. So these are different types of tests, but they're all comparing two normally distributed populations. And the actual calculation for this is complicated. Calculating for something called t, we're going to be taking the two means, x1, x bar 1, minus x bar 2 divided by the square root of s1 divided by n1. So that's the standard deviation of oh, squared. 
it's actually the deviation total, but standard deviation squared over the number of samples for population one, which also gives us our x1, plus s2 squared divided by n2, which is the standard deviation for the second population squared divided by the number of samples in sample two. What we can really see here and what, I, what the take-home message here is, the take-home message is not, we're going to be doing this on our own on the exam. No. No. The take-home message is, bigger deviation makes for a smaller T. Bigger number of samples given the same amount of deviation makes for a bigger T. A bigger difference makes for a bigger T. And that T can be negative or positive. So a bigger T just means in magnitude. So if X is, X1 is bigger than X2, positive T. If it's a lot bigger and there's very small error, big positive T. If X2 is bigger than X1, negative T. And the same things are kind of true. The more the error, the more the samples. So we want a lot of samples. We want a low amount of deviation. And we want a big difference if we want a big T. Well, what does it matter? Big T, little t, Mr. T? The T distribution is how often T values will be found given a neutral set of tests on subjects. Larger T values finding a bigger difference are less common. And you see this distribution, and yes, the T distribution looks like a normal distribution, such that the T value of zero is the most common t value. It's the modal t value. It's also the median t value of all t values given. It's also the mean t value. And the mode, the median, and the mean are all zero. That's pretty close to our normal distribution. Also, 95% of the population of t values is going to be within two standard deviations of the of zero, really. So P is less than 0.05 are those tails way out there at the edges of the T distribution. So P equals is less than 0.05 means this is a rare occurrence, which is how we say this is a significant difference because it is a big difference with little variability. That's what we mean. We say this T test has a significant difference is the T value is large enough to signify a big difference. So if my potatoes really overproduce compared to the carrots, and I can see a difference that is very large, and there's not much variation, and the sample number is, well, I'm going to get a fair number of samples there, it's a good garden, then I can say that next year it would be more productive for me to plant carrots if they were to produce more given this value, or produce potatoes. So doing that t-test can tell me if there is a big enough difference. And if there isn't a big enough difference, well, then I'm probably going to do, probably going to do carrots because I just like them. I mean, they're good. So, yeah. They can be eaten over weeks because you can keep thinning them. That's kind of nifty. Kids love harvesting them. Okay. So that's the t-distribution, the t-tests. Let's look at the ANOVA. If I were to compare three things. Variability within between groups. I'm not comparing means. An ANOVA test alone does not compare means. An ANOVA test with something called a Tukey post hoc test compares means. That Tukey post hoc test, though, is comparing means in the way that a repeated number of t-tests would. So an ANOVA will produce a graph or will be used with a graph that has means and variation. But what we're looking at is the means between groups and the means within groups. Lettuce plants will produce, on average, two salads. Swiss chard plants will produce, on average, two salads. The Swiss chard variation is about zero. They will produce two salads each pretty much straight up. The lettuce variation is one, plus or minus one. Some lettuce plants will only produce one salad. Some lettuce plants will produce three salads. So the variation is present, 
but not very large. So if I were to use an ANOVA on two groups, and you can, then what I would see is I would see that the variation within is actually pretty low. But ANOVA is often used on, two, on more than two groups because you can just compare the differences. But if I were to throw kale in there, kale can produce, in my garden, five to ten salads, largely because we don't like big salads when we're doing kale. Also because it's a biannual. It can live for two years and you can produce during the winter. So kale now has five to ten salads. Five to ten means probably a mean of seven plus or minus you know, three. And there are kale plants out there that can produce 11 salads. I don't like kale, but it's a, it's a great healthy food. So the means are different and the variability between groups is now different. So the variability between lettuce and Swiss chard is zero. They can each produce two salads. The variability within groups is present, but not very, very, not really that large. But kale is this plant with a much larger number of salads and a larger variability. So we can actually see then, is that variability between groups greater than the variability within a group? And if that kale is producing large and small plants, it's rather variable. And will it actually be producing enough different that it overcomes a variability within itself. And that will give you an F value, which is actually really hard to calculate. And there's a lot of things behind it. And I taught it once and nobody liked it, including me. <laughs> the basis of it is you have variability within and variability between. So the variability between, I think, was the numerator and the variability within is the denominator. So very larger variability within, smaller F value. And we look at this uh, high variability between groups, bigger F value. We look at the F distribution. And most F values are relatively small. So that tail, it's not a normal distribution, no. Most F values are small. Some F values become a little larger. The larger the F value for a given number of groups slash samples is less probable. So P is less than 0.05 if your F value is very large, which means if you have a very small variability, but a big difference between groups, big F value, significant ANOVA. A significant ANOVA does not tell you that kale produces more. A significant ANOVA tells you that kale has a higher variable, that has less variability within itself than it does variability between kale and um, Swiss chard. That is something I would want to know. I say that I know kale produces more. It's, it's disturbingly fecund. I know kale produces more, but it doesn't produce enough more to be valuable to me. The answer is probably going to be a yes if I wanted to eat kale. I do plan on planning it next year. Last up, kind of an intro. Linear regression. Not linear, of course. So linear regression, all samples here have an X value and a Y value. We're going to get into this more later, but really it's showing a correlation between two different um, things. And I want to compare it here because if we were looking at the amount of sunlight that my plants get, and I planted carrots along the entire garden, just full on invest in carrots, then I want to know, does more sun mean more carrots or does more shade mean more carrots? You're going to say, of course, more sun means more carrots. But remember, these plants wilt when it gets too hot out. So I've already had water to squash twice today. So those plants will wilt because it's way too sunny in one place, one part of the garden. So it could be that the carrots actually get sun scorched with too much sun. And it could mean that they get um, too little sun could actually mean they don't grow at all. So it may be a linear value, but then again, it might actually not. There might be an optimum. So a linear regression would hopefully say more sun equals more carrots, but but remember, nature's a little more complex than that. And gardening's a little more complex than that. So that's this, the statistics. One kind of take home message here, besides what a key test and a note really do, is just plant a lot of different things in a garden and just hope for the best. Something will grow no matter what weather it is.